And now our task is, you know, we've been in office for three years. Um, I hope there are more in our future. But if not, you know, we've been able to establish our tribal state relations office, these expectations that are now codified into law, that's simply the work that Minnesota should have been doing for the last 163 years. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Native Minnesota, a podcast about the Native American experience in Minnesota and beyond. I'm your host, Rebecca Crook Stratton. I'm the secretary treasurer of the Shakopee Midwakton Sioux community. This podcast is a project of Understand Native Minnesota, a campaign focused on improving the narrative about Native Americans in Minnesota's public schools. Today's episode is special because we're joined by the wonderful Minnesota Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. We talk about her mission, the problem of Native invisibility and Native representation in government. It's a great conversation and I hope you enjoy it. I'm here today with the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota, our 50th Lieutenant Governor, uh, who is also a pretty uh, amazing woman in her own right with a really long list of amazing credentials. Um, And at the top of that list is also a mother. Uh, So welcome. Um, Thank you for joining us on Native Minnesota. We appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I know that um, we've been trying to to sit down and have this conversation uh, for a long time, so I'm excited to be here. Well, you are super busy right now, um, kind of in full swing, budgeting among a whole bunch of other things. Uh, what what is your day to day? How do you keep yourself? you know, in good spirits and in good shape so you can tackle the many issues that are in front of you? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I wish that I could tell you that I have um, the secret to balancing everything and and figuring it all out and how to get it all done, Um, but I don't. Uh, So, you know, every day, Uh, looks a little bit uh, different um, from one day to the next. But so much of uh, what I spend my time uh, doing is really focusing on um, children and families and policy, making sure that we are centering uh, Black, Native, uh, communities of color in our policy making, um, being able to, to be at events in community, um, you know, uh, with COVID protocols in place. And that's been, um, that's been a little challenging, but really uh, has been trying to, to focus on making sure that we are centering um, the people who are most impacted uh, with the, the work that we do every day, um, while simultaneously trying to make sure that um, my family is taken care of (laughs) and the dog is fed and um, all that, all the the same things that, you know, um, uh, moms across the state are are trying to to navigate, right? Um, uh, I'm doing it at the same time as as being lieutenant governor. Um, So it's uh, every day is an adventure and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. I can absolutely relate to every day being an adventure. Um, You know, getting out the door in the morning with three kids and getting them to school is always an adventure. Um, You know, in in today's COVID era and kind of just this craziness we're living through, um, all of our institutions are facing a lot, right? But especially our education institutions. I know for me, every day I'm waiting for the email to see if they're going back online or um, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know you're facing a lot of policy issues around how do we handle COVID? How do we get out vaccines? Um, What are kind of some of your your top priorities and, you know, what are you most proud of, too, in the state dealing with uh, this pandemic? And Sure. Well, we are in... uh, month 21 um, of of the COVID pandemic. And uh, I certainly didn't think that this would uh, be um, uh, where where we would be in sort of this journey with um, with COVID. 
but, you know, very early on uh, in March of 2020, I lost my brother uh, to COVID. Um, he was the second person uh, to pass away in Tennessee um, from, from COVID-19. And so that's the lens through which I have you know, seen this entire pandemic is as a, you know, someone who lost a, a family member and, um, you know, have tried to bring that perspective uh, into, into the work. And so very early on, so much of what we were doing was just trying to keep people safe because we didn't have additional tools. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we were able to do uh, with our tribal nations in, in Minnesota, and that felt like a real partnership as we had folks who are, you know, protecting their nations, who are in executive leadership in the same way that, you know, we were trying to do this in Minnesota and learned a lot from each other, and that was um, very powerful. You know, as we are talking now about um, Omicron, which is incredibly contagious, um, you know, it's it's difficult, but we also have a lot of tools that we didn't have, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic with vaccines and boosters and now, you know, robust testing that's in place. So those are the things that I know um, work. But the thing that's been hard is that I can't convince people to care about each other. And I think that that's a big part of why we are where we are. But what I've been so excited to see is just how, you know, Indian country has stepped up with, you know, making sure that we have you know, the highest rates of vaccination for our communities and for our people. And we need to keep pushing to make sure that our little ones are getting vaccinated as well. But all of that, you know, knowing that our children are being impacted more than anyone else. Um, you know, I have a third grader and, uh, you know, it was her kindergarten year is the only year that hasn't been impacted by COVID, which is just like, you know, so hard to, to think about. So, you know, making sure that our kids are, um, you know, we're encouraging schools and districts to, to mask up, to encourage kids to stay home um, when, they're, when they're sick, moving to online learning when, when they need to do so. Um, and these next few uh, weeks are going to be really hard in Minnesota and across the nation. So just, you know, making sure that we're there for folks. But we know what we need to do, and we simply need people um, to, to do it. Yep. And that's what's so hard about, you know, I can't convince you to, to care about your, your neighbor. Um, um, but we're going to try to give you as many tools as possible to keep yourself safe and others too. We're all in this together, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I really appreciate about your leadership, not only in your current role, but you are a people person and you do stress that, you know, we are in this together and we need to take care of each other. Um, and I, I see you bring people to the table that have never been at the table before, especially our tribal nations across Minnesota. Um, you know, signing the, the executive order that uh, requires consultation and having our um, tribal liaisons and all the, the state departments and um, supporting commissioners has been really impactful to Indian country. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, definitely the, the importance uh, that was to you and kind of how you managed to convince, you know, others across the state that this is important enough to, to sign into law. For sure. So that has been, um, if we do nothing else, I feel like that's been a, a really important accomplishment um, of uh, codifying in law executive order uh, 1924. And you know, so much of that is driven by, um, I think folks think, oh, there's a Ojibwe woman as lieutenant governor, so of course they're going to do that. But I also want to make sure that the governor gets a lot of credit here, too. Um, I've been friends with Tim Walls for a very long time, um, and you know, making sure that our tribal nations, um, you know, treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, honoring this government to government relationship has always been important to him. It certainly was when he was in Congress. And so, you know, even when we were on the campaign trail, it was, I want to make sure that people look at Minnesota as a model for how to try to get this, this right. And so it's been a priority um, of ours since the beginning. 
And now our task is, you know, we've been in office for three years. Um, I hope there are more in our future. But if not, you know, we've been able to establish our tribal state relations office, these expectations that are now codified into law, that simply the work that Minnesota should have been doing for the last 163 years. You shouldn't have to have Native people in office to do right by Native people. Uh, but here we are. We're making that change. And... Um, we also wouldn't have been able to, you know, arrive at this point and have that law if, you know, the tribes themselves weren't pushing for it, working on the legislation. It was um, a real collective effort, and I'm excited to see what else we can do um, when we're working together uh, on issues that are priorities both for the tribes and for um, the state of Minnesota. And I, I think you... Um your uh, election to office as lieutenant governor um, really raised awareness that Native people are still here, right? Mm -hmm. There's this invisibility of Native people across Minnesota, and I think we really saw that when we had a booth at the State Fair this year and why Understand Native Minnesota, um, our campaign to increase representation in the K-12 through school district mm -hmm. is really important. And, and I know education is an important initiative to you, uh, which I think that's something we we definitely share, sure. um, you know, to be able to see our, our kiddos represented in the curriculum in their, you know, K through 12 education. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, your efforts to uh, ensure there's that representation in school and maybe a little bit about, you know, in Minnesota, we have wonderful school systems and school districts, but uh, that's really for, you know, middle class white folks and that there is a, a huge divide when it comes to education of people of color across the state and some of the things you're doing to, to address that. Sure. Well, um, you know, I think the, the thing that I found uh, in, in serving in the, the legislature um, was that there were a lot of teachable moments um, that we have available to us uh, as Native people here in Minnesota. And on my last day on uh, the floor of the House, my last day serving in the legislature, um, there was uh, uh, one of my colleagues, a legislator, came up to me and he said, I didn't know that you were Native. I thought you were Jewish. I thought Native people were all dead. And this is like, and I, I said, no, I, you know, I was like, surprise, we're still here. Um, but also was this moment where, um, you know, so many of us, uh, Representative Susan Allen, um, at the time, uh, Representative, now Senator Mary Kunesh, uh, and Representative Beckerfin, the Native Women's Caucus, and we're, you know, consistently talking about, ind you know, Indian issues on the House floor. And yet... There still was this perception that somehow, you know, we no longer existed. And I guarantee that this representative has Native people who uh, they represent um, and because uh, we're everywhere. Uh, but there was, you know, just that showed me how important it is to make sure that our kids are learning all about, right, uh, Minnesota and the history of Minnesota and the history of Minnesota Makoche, right, that, um, you know, there, Minnesota, there, there were people in Minnesota before Minnesota was Minnesota. Yep. And um, that it is a disservice to our Native children, but also to our non-Native children, unless we are talking about the full picture of who we are and where we come from. Um, the folks who benefit... Uh, from us being relegated to the past, right, um, and not being able to exist as contemporary people are folks in power who, you know, um, uh, don't want to in, invest in us or the policies that would improve our lives. And I would argue, you know, if Indian country is doing well, the rest of the state is doing well. So these are things that if we start early, we start in our K-12 education system, we're not going to have leaders who are serving in all different sorts of roles who don't know about, um, you know, the the first people of, of this state. Um, and, I, and in many ways in Minnesota, I think that um, people want to do the right thing, 
but there is this discomfort with like, what if I do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing? And so folks just put their head down and like our job. And I think the work, you know, that, that you're doing um, around making sure that our educational system reflects the, the kids in the classroom, um, you know, is, is to really make sure that it's this opportunity um, for everybody to, to learn more about who they are and where they come from. And we don't have to, do the 15, 20 minute preamble that as Native people, we always have to do when we're talking about our issues or our experiences. We're going to save a lot of time, right? And we're also going to develop um, uh, just young people who are ready for this full, beautiful world um, to take it on because they have the skill set and the background that they won't have um, otherwise. Yeah, that's so true. As you know, Indian people across the state know, we do usually have to give, you know, a couple hundred years of history before we can really dive into the the meat of things. Um, you know, I, I this past week has been a week of reflection for me, and I think there's so much historical trauma in our communities, right? And that's for a variety of reasons. But I was really thinking back about. My grandparents. So both my grandparents were products of boarding schools, mm -hmm. and you probably have similar mm -hmm. um, things in your family. But so as products of boarding schools, you know, they, they probably weren't the best parents ever. I mean, they absolutely loved their children, but there was kind of a gap there. And so my dad had six brothers. So there were, were seven boys and, you know, all uh, amazing people in their own right. But definitely... Um, they weren't taught the Dakota language because my grandparents didn't want them to, um, you know, be too Dakota because they didn't want them to go through the things that they went through in boarding schools and trying to, you know, get jobs and be accepted. Um, so you're left with this generation of Native people who aren't really Native but aren't really white, you know, living on reservations and has such a huge impact, right? So that's part of the historical trauma we're seeing. Um, and that's part of the education I think is really important and maybe some of the disconnect and gaps that we see. I mean, can you talk a little bit about kind of that, that historical trauma and how it impacts you or maybe influences you uh, to, to be on the path that you're on today? For sure. Um, and thank you for, um, for that and for sharing that because it is, it is, um, it is part of all, many of us, right? And all of us in some way has shaped uh, who we are. And, you know, uh, boarding schools are one generation removed from, from my family. And there certainly was a lot of uh, trauma Um but also I think the the disconnect here and what is so important for educators now to know is the history of boarding schools, both, you know, um, military boarding schools, right, from the, the, the United States government. And um, while not explicitly government boarding schools, also our religious schools and uh, residential schools across the country, too, this, the goal was the same, right, to, to kill the Indian to save the man. Okay. And so for so many of our grandparents and our parents, when we see a disconnect with a child now who is not having a positive school experience, um, does not feel welcomed, one of the most loving things, and it's done from a place of love, right, is when a parent or grandparent maybe tries to remove that kid from that situation, it's not because of educational neglect. It's because I'm trying to keep you safe and protect you from an experience that I had that was deeply traumatic in the same way that you talked about, you know, not speaking the language because I want to keep you safe, right? Um, that's real. And those are the things that I feel like once our, our educators hear that, once policymakers hear that, once people in you know the private sector, philanthropy hear that, you feel a shift. There's a change. Oh, I had no idea. That explains so much. Why wasn't I taught that in school? And so if we start, we start to get to the place where that is a foundation where people understand that trauma and a little bit around like why things are the way they are, that's when we can work to correct them. And we're in this moment where we have a hard time telling the truth. Um, and that is the only thing that is going to disrupt these systems to allow us to start to close um, some of 
some of these gaps. But, you know, um, when I think about that and what that means in our own family, um, it also means that, you know, my my dad talked a lot about uh, my dad, uh, Marvin Pen- Many Penny, um, would often say, my girl, you know, I want to burn the system down and you want to change it from the inside out and we need both. And that's just true. So we need to tell the story. We need to talk about the system, right, that was so destructive and hurt us so much. And we have to work like hell to make sure that we're changing it. Um, and a big part of that is the truth telling about what actually happened to our people and our families that is so close, right, um, uh, to, to who we are today and right now. Well, and just a, yeah, I mean, just a generation removed was the boarding school era and then kind of this generation of in-betweens. But yeah. now look at our generation. Um, you know, while we still face barriers, we still have a lot of opportunity. And that's one of the things I always like to focus on is, you know, na- there's a lot of stereotypes that mm-hmm. go along with Native people. But there are a lot of really amazing things happening in our communities that are empowering people, that are, you know, are lifting them up out of some of the situations that, that our communities have faced. And it's really exciting. And I think we're prime examples mm-hmm. of, of that work that's going on where we've, we've had the opportunity to get an education. Um, we've had the opportunity to, you know, organize and lift up our communities and you're continuing to do that. Um, and how do we continue to, um, uplift the next generation to ensure they have the same, you know, empowerment and opportunities that we've been afforded? Well, that's a great question, and I think um, I think y- I watch you do this all the time, um, and it feels like uh, it is just part of your nature. Um, and I don't know if you you notice that you do it or not, but it is consistently talking about you know emerging leaders in the community and lifting them up, and um, so it's it's contagious, <laughs> and, and I really appreciate it. I. Um, you know, one of the people, and as we were talking about boarding schools, like one of the people who um, was really important uh, in my development is uh, Dr. Brenda Child, who um, is a professor in American Studies at the University of Minnesota. And, you know, I walked into her classroom my sophomore year at the University of Minnesota, and for the first time in my whole life, I saw a teacher at the front of the room who looked like me. And I saw a classroom full of other Native students, and it was a game changer. Um, you know, I wasn't a great, don't tell Siobhan, don't tell my daughter, but I wasn't a great student in high school. But in college, like, I was like, oh, this isn't just about me. This is about our entire community, right, and doing right by our people, which is a totally different motivator. And I think for a lot of our Indigenous youth, like, is the thing that feels different and, like, the thing that we have to plug into but, you know, Brenda was like, you're smart. You should think about taking, you know, honors courses or graduate level coursework, which I would have never thought about before. But because here is another indigenous woman saying, like, I believe in you. You can do this. Um, I, I believed her. Uh, and now, you know, part of my job is to make sure that, like, we are creating opportunities for more young people and more young Native women in particular. And part of that is I'm sure that you get all the calls, too, when people are like, will you serve on this board? Will you speak at this thing? You know, like, people have the Rolodex that's just like Indian woman, right? Like, and, like, you pull out the card and <laughs> there's so the list, true. right? Um, and part of the thing that we can do is say, like, you know what? I can't, but I have this incredible, you know, emerging leader that I think would be a great fit for you. And so those are some of the things that we can um, start to do or listening to um, young people talk about policy solutions that, um, you know, like they know what they need. We just need to lift it up. Right. And and to fund it and then just get out of the way. Um, so those are some of the things that I, I think we can do. Um And just, you know, make sure that we are not continuing the crabs in a bucket um, lateral violence that happens um, 
every day, right, in um, our community that is not traditional. It's not part of who we are. And I think that's one of the most powerful tools that we have in our toolbox to help and support this next generation of leaders is by saying, I'm not going to engage in that kind of destructive colonial behavior. Absolutely. Oh, I love that crabs in a bucket. I think we see that not only, you know, I, I think it's something we see in Native communities, but I think we see it in professional workplaces all the time. Like somebody just starts to get ahead and people want to pull them down. It's so unfortunate. Absolutely. But yes. Um, I'm going to switch directions on you a little bit. So as part of the Understand Native Minnesota campaign, we have Twitter and Instagram accounts Mm -hmm. um, to just share some facts. It was something we did when we had to kind of pivot uh, (laughs) during the pandemic Mm because obviously uh, our work really wanted to center around teachers and engaging with teachers and administrators, but they kind of have their plates full right Right. now. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So we launched uh, some social media accounts. Folks can follow us at Native Minnesota Facts, Native MN Facts, uh, if they're interested. But we asked our followers, what should we ask the lieutenant governor? Um, So we got a couple of really, well, we got a lot of really great questions. Obviously, I can't ask them all. um, But you kind of touched on this one. What advice would you give to young Native students in Minnesota? I think some of the the best advice that um, that I could give is to take up space, um, you know, for uh, my experience, you know, in elementary school was hearing, right, Columbus discovered America, right, in 1492, and just, like, sitting in my desk and, like, feeling like I couldn't speak up, I couldn't move, um, and uh, now... <laughs> <laughs> um, my daughter has no problem like raising her hand and saying like, I don't think that's right. Um, and you know, uh, someday, uh, she will be disrupting, you know, um, other spaces and places and I, uh, I will cheer her on. Um, but I think that's just a big part of it is to take up space, to be unafraid, um, to say, well, actually that's not my experience. Um, and to, to know that there are folks um, out there and there are leaders who are out there who support that. Um, and I think that once we start to talk about it and once Native um, students start to talk about the things that they need, um, that that oftentimes uh, that they'll hear that other students in their class um, need it as well. But student voices are really, really powerful. Um, and I think it is, you know, really starting to tap into that power, um, the story of their individual narratives. And, you know, that is one of the most powerful tools in our toolbox is to talk about their own experiences and being unafraid. So take up that space. I don't know if you do this, but um, when I sit down at a table, I, I like you know, claim my territory. <laughs> so like I've got, you know, my coffee, my phone, my purse, my note, and just like spread out. Uh, and in some ways I want our students, right, to, to do that too when they're in spaces, to be able to be their full, beautiful indigenous selves and know that there are people who have their backs, um, even if it doesn't always feel like it. Uh, and um, to be willing to to take risks and knowing that there are people who support you in that. I love that. I'm so inspired by our young people these days. I mean, you just, everywhere you look, they are doing amazing things. They're Mm -hmm. uplifting issues in their communities and taking action and organizing. And I think back to when I was young, I'm like, I was not nearly as cool Mm -mm. as these (laughs) kids today doing all these amazing things. So I love that. Um, In your view, this is another one from from Twitter, uh, what is the biggest misconception about being Native? Ooh, that's like a, that's a whole show, right? (laughs) Um, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of stereotypes, I think, that, you know, you named earlier that people have about, um, about Indigenous um, people, and I would say also, like, Indigenous women in particular, Um, but, you know, the biggest one is that people think that we don't exist anymore. Uh, which feels like such a, uh, you know, silly thing to say, but it's just the the reality. I think um, 
the the survey that was done by Illuminative said that like 40% of Americans don't know that Native American people still exist. That's incredible. And it also is the root of why we experience a lot of what we experience. So there's that just that we exist, that um, we come in all different shapes, sizes, skin tones. Um, and, you know, I think the the thing um, that has been uh, hard for me, and I know, you know, other people here too, is when you meet someone, they're like, oh, you're Native. You don't look Native. And I think, you know, earlier in my life, I'd say, like, oh, yeah, I know, and da-da-da-da-da. And now I'm like, oh, that's interesting. What do you think a Native person is supposed to look like, right? And so the confidence of, you know, um, you know, my age maybe is coming out a little bit more. But then that usually leads into someone saying, like, uh, oh, I, and I was like, well, you know, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm Native through and through. Or when people ask about, like, your, your blood quantum or percentage or whatever, um, you know, that we just need to start being able to feel like we can shut that down and then move on to something else. Um, but uh, that's a, a big part of it is simply that we, this misperception that we don't exist. And um, I think we are uh, doing everything we can to try to lift that visibility. And I think that's why it's so important, you know, um, the work that, that you're doing with educators, but now just like broadly um, with Minnesotans and having a presence at the, the state fair and just, um, just showing up like we're everywhere. Um, and if folks don't know that, then they just haven't been paying attention. Yes, we are absolutely everywhere. And, and it's wonderful to be able to have these, you know, very visible role models for our students. Now you being one of them, um, you know, Representative uh, Sharice Davids and, you know, Secretary Holland and uh, just all these very prominent uh, Indigenous women, too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's really a wonderful time to, to be an Indigenous woman uh, in the United States. So, all right, I got one more question from our list. Um, how do you balance life as a mom admits <laughs> your other roles? Um, um, I'm curious. Not very, like, like, yeah, like, how, not very how well. Do we do this? Um, <laughs> not very well. And to your, you know, to your earlier point, like I just want to name like for our, for our girls, their reality is just that native women are in leadership positions, right? Like that's just normal. Like, you know, your daughters are like, oh, mom's the secretary treasurer, right, of of a nation, right, of a community. It's um, it's powerful. And Siobhan is like, you know, when I first became lieutenant governor, she said, she's like, mom, I don't understand what the big deal is. She's like, you work in the same building. You just have a different job. And it was like very humbling, um, but also just that's just right. And then, you know, Auntie Jamie is the chair of the Judiciary Committee. And, you know, Auntie Deb is on Zooms with Mommy. Like, it's just, that's just how it is. And we had this moment um, a couple weeks ago when Sharice Davids was in town. And um, Sharice and I uh, went to dinner with Louise Erdrich, which was like just bananas. And the next day took Siobhan over to the bookstore so she could like just spend some time with them. I was like, this is amazing. She's like, oh, I liked your friends, right? Like, <laughs> just like, you know, like how it is. So, um, so anyway, to your original question, like that's part of the balance is that I take my kid with me everywhere. And, you know, I hope that um, sometimes it's an eye roll or mom, can we go, especially if we're in Target and we run into someone and they talk to me about something, but also that she knows that, um, that my responsibility, first and foremost, is to make sure that she is loved and safe and supported, but also that I have a responsibility to my community, and so does she. And so, you know, trying to, to be able to model that. But I will tell you, there is a whole lot of dinosaur chicken nuggets in our house. <laughs> um, we have pizza Fridays, um, but sometimes we have, like, pizza Tuesdays <laughs> too um, and uh, just try to try to make it all work but the time that is really sacred in our house is bedtime um, and even if 
we haven't been able to spend a whole lot of time um, together. Sometimes I'll be on a Zoom call and Siobhan and I will like color a picture together. And those are some of the things that we can do. But bedtime is really that time where, you know, we talk, we pray, um, you know, we read stories, but it's just, it is just mom and Siobhan time. And she has this bunk bed and like, it's like this little like cave cozy with like fairy lights everywhere. And it's just our time. And so, you know, someday uh, I hope that uh, she's able to see that while, you know, um, we didn't always get to do all the things we wanted to do together that we had, um, that she was safe and loved and could see how much um, her mom loves her and how much her mom tried to love her people and community too. Yeah. Yep. But there's a lot of, a lot of shortcuts yes. in our house right now. Um, you can't see it if you're listening to the podcast, but my hair is back. And that <laughs> means it was like fresh out of the shower and just put it in a bun and I get out oh, the door. Right. Um, and just do what you do. Yep. Oh, mm-hmm. I do the same thing. My hair very rarely gets done these days. And we had uh, leftovers last night because the fridge was full of stuff and we were busy. So, exactly. Yes. Yep. I'm like it's a free for all guys. Find whatever <laughs> you it. want. Um, there's, you know, been days where we've eaten dinner for breakfast the next morning. 100%. So yep. I absolutely uh, can relate to that. Um, I know we're starting to run out of time here, but, um, you know, I just got a couple more questions mm-hmm. that I I could ask you questions all day. I could just chat with you all day. Um, but I, you've had a lot of opportunities and worked with some really amazing people. Can you talk a little bit about the role models that have kind of shaped and influenced you and, um, you know, helped you get to where you are today? Sure. Um, well, I have been really lucky. Um, I have been really lucky that there have been people who have been willing to take a chance on me and invest in me. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Child, like I said, um, was the first, uh, the first teacher who really saw me, um, and she made a tremendous difference. And now I love seeing her in community, um, and, uh, catching up and just reminding her how responsible she is, whether she likes it or not, (laughs) right. For, um, you know, for, for being in this role. But I think about folks like, um, you know, Marlene Helgemo who uh, has just consistently been an auntie for me whenever I have needed her. She married my husband um, and, and me and, uh, and um, is always there and always checking in and understands the complexities of, you know, the political system and trying to, to balance everything and take care of yourself and um, has always uh, been there to, to cheer me on. I think Marlene is a cheerleader for many of us. <laughs> sure. I would also put her <laughs> in my list of role models and mentors. So Absolutely. That's wonderful. I love her. And that's just yep. what she does, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and there's just like auntie crew um, and they just push us and all of a sudden you're like doing stuff where you're like oh I didn't I guess I'm doing this I didn't know that I was going to do this and so that's a big part of it and you know I would also um say that folks like Robert Lilligren um uh who when I first ran for the school board was right by my side as he was the first um uh native person elected to city government in in Minneapolis and um I just I've been so lucky uh, and so, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can to, to do that for other people. But the one, like, phrase that I carry with me all the time is from LaDonna Harris. Uh, when I was uh, um, worked in the Native American Political Leadership Program um, at GW, uh, I invited her and she talked to our students and it was so wonderful. But one of the things that she said um, because one of the rules in my class was that um, we don't out Indian each other here. I love that. Like we're all here, right, because we want to do better for our people. Um, and so, you know, we were talking about that. And she said, and you know what? I, any space that I'm in, she's like, I'm a Comanche woman all the time. And here's someone who has worked with, 
you know, several administrations, has made policy change, and was just such an incredible reminder, I think, for the students in that, that class and, you know, to me, that um, people want you to sort of, like, check your identity at the door, and it is incredible disservice if we were to do that. Like, I watch Deb Holland now, who is fully, like, her full, beautiful Indigenous self and in how she shows up um, and how she dresses and... And like that is normalizing Native women in leadership and, you know, in the public sphere. And so um, that also uh, I would consider, you know, Deb a mentor, but it's just all of these, it's our time, like right now, it's all happening. Um, and I think our job is to keep up that momentum um, and continuing to show up as our full selves in every place and space, even when it's hard. And I see Native women stepping up and out into leadership positions, you know, kind of all over the place. And, mm -hmm. and it's so wonderful to see. But I think sometimes, too, there's this uh, hesitancy from the general public. Well, Native people are only going to care about Native people or Native issues. And I always like to remind people that, you know, Native values really are about community Absolutely. and about, you know, helping each other and helping people. And so how do you, you know, kind of bat down some of those, you know, comments? And because and, I'm sure you've You've received oh, yeah. uh, many of those. So how do you deal with that? For sure. Well, at first, you know, and this is, you know, way back in the day in 2004 when I ran for the school board, um, you know, towards the beginning of the campaign, folks would ask me that, like, are you, you know, are you just going to, you know, work for Native people? And towards the end of the campaign, and now, like, one of the things that I've taken with me is to just ask, like, do you ask, like, white candidates if they're only going to work for white people? And um, and the answer is like, oh, of course not. And I was like, right. Like we are bringing, um, you know, when you talk about the the values, right, we think about like the seven grandfather teachings, right, of, you know, love and honesty, humility. Those are all things that should be part of how we are making decisions, how we care about each other, how we govern. Um, and I, I think that that's a good thing that that serves everybody. But we have, you know, I think about like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said, you know, she's asked the question, like, how many women is enough on the Supreme Court? And she's like, when there are nine, it's the same thing. Like we, um, you know, when we think about parity, about Native people in leadership, right, in elected government, we have a long way to go. And so, you know, we are just going to have to continue to have these conversations. Um but I would say that happens to, you know, of course it happens to Native folks in, in office. It happens to, you know, immigrants or the black community because our quote-unquote norm, right, is, um, you know, has essentially uh, been white men in positions of leadership. Um, that is what is normalized. And, and so just continuing to push back and say, like, you know, I think can confidently represent um, everybody in Minnesota and and folks get to decide, right? Like if they want that to happen or if they want yep. that to continue, right? And and so we got a we got a choice. Well, I think that's one of the things we have to stop seeing is, you know, those those barriers or labels that, you know, stop us from embracing absolutely everybody mm -hmm. um, across our communities despite, you know, religion, color, you know, p politics, all that stuff. Um, so one final question. You are diving into another campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we will have you and Governor Walls for another four years. Appreciate um, that. <laughs> what's next? What's next for the Flanagan Walls uh, administration? Well, right now we are working on our budget and that's going to roll out pretty soon. Um, and that has been taking a lot of our time. But, you know, I think what folks can expect is that we are going to focus on things like paid family and medical leave, investments in child care, education, um, you know, trying to continue to, to put more resources into Indigenous education for all is a big, you know, priority for me. So you can see that we're also going to be 
hitting the road um, and uh, running for, for re-election. Um, I can tell you that uh, serving in this role has been the honor of my lifetime, and it has been really hard. Um, you know, and sometimes the governor will, will look at me and he'll say, if you knew then what you know, what you know now, right? Like, would you sign up to do this again? Um, and the answer, you know, is absolutely yes. Um, uh, you know, we don't, we don't pick uh, the, the issues um, or the challenges that we will be faced with. Um, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done. We have more to do. Uh, and uh, I hope that Minnesota gives us that opportunity um, to, to continue uh, to do that work. Fantastic. Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a wonderful conversation, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. I would love that, Miigwech. Oh. Thank you so much for having me, and um, yeah, let's, let's do this again. All right, sounds good. Thank you for joining me for the Native Minnesota podcast. For more episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also visit our website, understandnativemn.org, to learn more about our campaign's work to improve the Native narrative in Minnesota's public schools.